sir. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, let's see. The unintended comedy starts. As I said, or as Martin alluded to, uh, I'm filling in short of last note, uh, short notice, but I didn't want to pass up on this opportunity at all. Um, it's wonderful to be here uh, at the DICE event, the very first DICE event in Europe. I'm a huge fan of the Academy, as, as Martin said, and I think this is one of the unique uh, events in the industry where we can all actually get, get back together and kind of share some ideas, share some thoughts, and share experiences, the things that, that make our studios great and the challenges we face every day. And that's kind of the, the premise of my talk. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we, uh, how we view the world uh, and kind of how we're evolving and adapting as, 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 as a company. Then we'll take a brief look at some, some of the things that, uh, that we've been working on and we're, we're excited about. So I, I showed this very same slide in 2010 in Las Vegas. I'm not lazy, I just actually wanted to bring it back over here. So I talked a little bit about Darwinism and, and the games industry in general. And I'm a huge, uh, huge fan of the whole topic myself. I, I, uh, so for me, I take two, two things away from biology. One is when the environment changes ra radically uh, around an entity, a living entity, it either adapts to that environment or it becomes marginalized or it dies. And I think that's true for, for companies in, in any kind of changing environment. And I think the second thing that we can take away from biology is the complexity of any entity has to reflect the complexity of the environment. So basically, if you're an amoeba, uh, you can be very simple because your environment is fairly simple. Your mouth is your ass and that's basically it. That's your function. Um, but, and we all know people like that. Anyway, <laughs> so, but, but one of the things is that when, when you operate in a more complex environment, um, you, you need to become more complex yourself internally as well. So certainly I think the games industry today is much more complex than it was 10 years ago. It's even much more complex than it was three years ago. I mean, terms like user acquisition, analytics, virality, and all, the, all the kind of different math that go into to different kinds of games. And not only uh, kind of on that side, but also the con uh, content itself and the code itself. Shevok talked this morning about how we're introducing film-like technologies and, and stuff like that into the games. I, I think we can certainly see the complexity rising, and so our internal complexity has to, has to match that as well. Okay, kind of looking at, at Remedy's history, you, the one thing you'll spot is that we really haven't done that much, but what we've done has been successful, so we have a good batting average. Kind of for, for, for me, kind of the, the figures, uh, Victor was talking about going to 200 billion by 216. We've played our little part in this. Uh, our, our franchises have created about half a billion dollars in retail revenue when you look at that. Uh, obviously, a lot of that value going into the retail channel and our partners, uh, but things are changing with digital distribution as we go ahead. So for us, um, kind of the measures of success are how well we entertain people as well as the commercial, uh, commercial impact that, uh, that our franchises have. Currently, we're working on uh, an Xbox One exclusive title with Microsoft that we're really excited about. I'll show a little bit about that. And an unannounced iOS project. So we've worked on these different platforms, building our self-publishing operations as well. Uh, and and that, that's been a change in our, our company's philosophy. Um, so we do have already de with Death Rally, uh, we, we were able to, to kind of have our first go at the iOS market and hit number one in 70 markets. And we're really, really proud of that. In addition to our kind of AAA pedigree, uh, we've shifted over 10 million units of AAA titles. So kind of the, the Remedy game fundamentals. Um, when I talk about change, I want to talk a little bit about things that don't change, unlike my slides. So the cinematic experience, uh, I, I think, is, is, is a fundamental of, of a Remedy thing. Uh, they're story driven. Often the character and the character's dilemma is at the heart of the game. And we do draw from popular culture. So we try to look for inspiration outside of games. So we draw from movies, TV, and, and so forth, and bring that into the game space and make it into something of our own. Something that hasn't been done to death in the games industry, but is familiar to our audience, yet fresh in games. So the three things that I think won't change in, in, in a rapid, um, sort of even with all, all these things happening around us, people fundamentally want to be told stories. I think you know, th for thousands and thousands of years, we've had a yearning to be told stories, and people want to experience stories. We're storytellers at heart. Uh, and we do do that. The, the, you know, Rich touched on it uh, with, with his um, toilet analogy. Obviously, the, the gameplay cycles are very different, but you can tell a light story with caricatures, cliches, or classics, as we like to call them, and you can convey a lot with, with a little, uh, in, even in a short sp space of time. And I think that uh, that's fundamentally there. Whether it's a distraction or it's a destination, you can still tell stories. 
People like stylized delivery. And this is where I differ a little bit um, from kind of the user-generated content. We've certainly had mod tools out there and awesome content created. But people can fundamentally tell the difference between quality and not quality. So if you have Ridley Scott shooting a music video or a commercial or a film, you'll know it's a Ridley Scott thing or it's well done. The pacing's there, the camera angles are right, uh, kind of the foreshadowing, everything takes place in the right way. Whereas your cousin, you know, Bob, goes to shoot a home video, that might, mean, it might be personally impactful for you or it might be you, YouTube gold, but it's not exactly something that people will often lay down money for and, and, and feel that it's great value for, for that. So I think there is room for stylized delivery. And kind of people like interactivity. We forget this too much uh, as an industry, especially when, when you have story-driven studios. We're creating games. And that means that how it feels, how it responds uh, needs to be, it's at least as important as what you're telling them, kind of what the narrative is that you're conveying. So those were kind of some, some of the principles. I'll talk a little bit about how we're applying those in, in Quantum Break. So for Quantum Break for us is, is, is the ultimate remedy game. We're taking kind of the cinematic action for Max Payne uh, and putting that, uh, kind of raising the bar there. We're taking the interactive narrative from Alan Wake and we're pushing the envelope higher and bringing this all together and, and pushing it forward. So at its heart, Quantum Break is a cinematic action game with a story told in a new way. The theme of the game is time and there's a, it's a time travel mystery with a looming threat of time itself breaking down. At the heart of the action, we have the unique time manipulation powers of our main characters. So I'll show a little bit uh, uh, of kind of some of the, some of the things that we've, we've been working on. For us, we have kind of, in the fiction, um, it takes place in a, in a small university town of Riverport, and, and a time, tra time travel related experiment goes terribly, terribly wrong, and time itself starts to break down sort of kind of manifesting itself in anomalies, where time stops, moves forward, jerks itself back, and so forth. So th there could be epic stages of, of destruction and mayhem where we have the combat take place, or we have dramatic moments where you can see kind of the coffee spilling and kind of those frozen in time moments and so forth. So I'll show you a little bit uh, of, of kind of, in case you haven't seen this. So one of the things that we're doing, doing this time around, which caught a lot of people off guard, is we're actually combining linear storytelling with interactive storytelling. So essentially, even with the Max Payne games, we had a graphic novel kind of delivery for the story. With Alan Wake, we had prequels of live action shows. Our worlds have often had TVs that are functional and have kind of backstory and so forth. So a logical continuum of that for us was to take it to the ultimate level where the game actually comes with a TV show. So like in any good uh, TV, uh, TV series or, or film, the bad guy is somebody who comes close to stealing the show. So what, what you get to do in Quantum Break is you actually get to play the bad guy scheming, and you see two different futures come to pass. You make the choice, and that's impacted in all of your content, in the TV show and in the game as well. So it's not a choose your own adventure with multiple plot lines, but it's rather one story told in, in, in many ways. So what we do is we interleave the episodes of the game with episodes of the TV show. So at the end of each, you'll be making a choice which will be impacting what you watch. We think that's really, really cool. And one of the things that makes it possible for us is like Shabbat outlined some of the technical advances that we've had in storytelling tools for games. So for us, we've built a, a technology called Northlight specifically for storytelling. And for us, that means that we're able to deliver the actor's performance with every nuance captured. And you can see kind of they really are there on par, and that gets us out of the uncanny valley issues and allows us to marry these, these, uh, these kind of uh, mediums together seamlessly. So I'll show you a little, little bit of a, of a drama scene from, from the game. This is in-engine, running uh, on development hardware, development software. It's the real deal. Uh, no smoke and mirrors, no crap, but obviously for convenience, it's a video.
60 seconds, Jack. Okay. People would try to steal our research. Oh. Hard way. It's collapsing. Move it! Move! 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 Ah! So, I hope that gives you a better idea of what we're doing a quantum break and the characters over there. Um, we're not a launch title, so we still have time to push the quality even higher, so we're really, really happy with, with how that's working out. So I talked a little bit about the things that, uh, that stay constant, but I'd like to talk more about change, uh, as that seems to be, obviously, it's a, it's a common theme, theme in this, uh, this room. And I think, honestly, when people outside the industry will look at the games industry as a, as a test case for seeing accelerated change happen in, in, in any uh, kind of field and, and kind of industry, we have uh, consumer behavior patterns are changing, business models are changing, technological uh, capacity and kind of what we can do is, is going through the roof and so forth. So we have all of these, we have a confluence of changes happening at once, uh, which I think creates a perfect storm in many ways. Um, when we look at um, evolution, once again, going back to biology, uh, it's not, I mean, T-Rex didn't die because a bigger, badder dinosaur turned up. So, I mean, he was, he was probably the biggest, baddest dinosaur in the, in the forest, or the plains. But he died because the environment changed. And I think if you look at companies that are not succeeding in our industry, that's a fire alarm. Stay calm. <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, if, if, if we look at kind of um, the companies that are not succeeding or, or are dying away in our industry, they're really not being taken out by the competition so much as, as they are not evolving to, to kind of the environment around them. And, and that's, that's true. I think it's a natural part of the cycle. Uh, sometimes it can be painful, but I think it's very necessary as well. So kind of in, in business school, we often talk about core competency and kind of, what, what, kind of what's your uh, firm's competitive advantage, and it's built around certain core competencies. I think increasingly when you look at an industry that's going through dramatic change, you can't really rely too much on your core competencies. I think the real core competency becomes adaptability. Your ability to learn is, is much more important than what you know. So basically, the ones who learn the quickest will be the ones who succeed. The ones, what you know right now might help you get a leg up and put you forward, but it really becomes a matter of adaptability. And the companies that adapt the quickest and read the signs on the wall will be the ones that succeed the best. Now, when you think about the culture, culture of your studio, and kind of what kind of culture you want to foster, uh, I think there's these, these are obviously opposite end of, ends of the spectrum. Woodstock is, is a free-for-all. Everybody does what the fuck they want to. Whereas North Korea, everything's dictated from the top down, and it's very uh, static and kind of, and kind of run, run from there. And I think if you look at different kinds of environments, a very top-down, hierarchical, efficient machine is really good for a static environment. And that works perfectly. Actually, a lot of companies have been built for static environments, where things are... Every process is defined, everything's broken down to the minute detail, and errors in judgment are, are co uh, collectively taken away. You look at total quality management and all that stuff, really works well for that. But in a time of rapid change, you actually want a culture that fosters a lot of innovation and you need to give a lot more freedom. Now, obviously, I think the boundaries of that freedom is, uh, is, 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 an, interesting, is an interesting topic, but I think you need to let people decide what they're doing spe specifically at that point in time. Maybe you give an overall target, but they get to define how they do it and who they do it with and when they do it. You just give an overall target and you, you let them loose. Uh, so I'm, I'm more in the Woodstock category, obviously. Um, I'm going to skip in the interest of time a video that, that would have maybe presented more thoughts on, on our studio, but we can save that for later data and put it online. Okay. 
So a few words on rules. Uh, at least for us, we found that as things are evolving very rapidly, we try to enforce very li little rules. I think we fall into the Netflix school of thought here, where you really need some rules that keep you out of jail as a CEO, which are awesome. And you want to respect your partner's secrets, so you want to you know, respect your NDAs, and those rules need to be tight. But on the other hand, you really don't want to be conveying too much procedure in, in, in your studio. Rather, you want to be conveying kind of why you're doing certain things, what are the values and where you want to drive it and why you want to go there, because this will actually enable the people on the ground to make the decisions immediately, and they're authorized to do those choices themselves. So if you look at military doctrine, uh, kind of the World War II was everything comes down from the staff. If you look at modern warfare, kind of how things are run, a lot of the decision making is being made on the front lines, and everybody's connected, and the information's shared. So I draw the analogy from that. I think absolutely companies in a quickly moving environment need to be able to push the decision making down to the front lines as, as soon as possible, as, as far down the line as you possibly can. Whether it's a technical choice, whether it's a production choice, or whether it's a business choice. So for example, when we look at pricing of, of, of some of our um, digital campaigns, for example, on Steam and so forth, we will be aggressive uh, with, with the prices that will really drive the demand up. And those calls are being made down the food chain uh, by, the, by the people who are responsible for that. I don't even necessarily know that we're going to go on a 90% discount in Steam. I, I'll know after the fact or before we go, but not making the call. So anyway, going forward a little bit, um, I think the kind of the, the talk uh, that, that we heard on kind of the Swedish culture really does apply for, for us as well. We're an international studio. I think about 40% of our, our, our team uh, comes from overseas. But I think for us, we, we dry, try to strive for cooperation above competition. I think we do believe in kind of an egalitarian uh, approach and a meritocracy. But also, um, I think it's very important for us to have a certain humility towards our work. Uh, the game is the star. Uh, I don't think any one of us really elevates ourselves above that. I think the game is, is, is what, what, what's really, really important. And I think for, for us, um, it, it's, it's having your studio brand be a seal of quality. I mean, whatever you put out there needs to be good. There is obviously a conflict with that and a minimum viable product mentality that's, that's uh, prevalent in, in the industry right now. The way we work around that is that we try to prototype a lot and then we kill those prototypes uh, ruthlessly uh, if, if they're not working. But whatever we ship has to be good. So we won't throw a, stuff, a ton of stuff out there into the market and see what works. Rather, we'll do that early on internally. Um, and, and obviously, that's, that's something that maintains our high batting average. So there's a great article by Martin Reeves and Mike Daimler, uh, written for the Harvard Business Review uh, a couple of years ago. Um, they wrote about uh, change and kind of uh, industries that, that, are, that are going through rapid transition, uh, and they've drawn uh, certain analogies from there. And obviously, I'm, I think the tagline that sticks, sticks, sticks to my mind was, uh, they basically say, in a world of constant change, the spoils go to the nimble. And I, th I don't think anything could be more, more true in the games industry today. Now, previously, uh, kind of once again falling back on, on kind of business school thinking, Market share and profitability uh, were seen as, as interlinked. If you go back to 1950, if you had the largest market share in your industry, whatever industry, on average, the market leader for market share, the chances that they would also be the profitability leader was about 30%. So a, a pretty good correlation. Unfortunately, if we look at this doctrine of thinking, in 2008, if you had the largest market share in any industry, the chances that you were also a profitability leader was 7%. And I think that really applies to the games industry as well. Having a massive portfolio and having a massive market share is probably not the way to success. I think the, the, the ultimately the, the most profitable companies, the most desirable companies in our industry will be either, as Victor said, defined by a worldwide niche or something else like that. I think that's a line of thinking that, that will, will go a lot further. Um, so a few thoughts on, on kind of how um, how we kind of at least try to try to look at look at these um, these moments and kind of drawing from from uh, from the article as well, the ability to read and act on signals of change. So that means a lot of your people inside your studio should be externally facing, and they should be in touch with a wide and broad network of people, if at all possible. And obviously, your decision making structure should be such that you can make quick decisions, you can change direction pretty rapidly, and that's really really important. So. It's cool to be able to read the signals of change, but if you can't act on it, it doesn't really help, right? So I think having, forcing your engineers, forcing your creative people also to interact with the, with the world as broadly as possible and take in impulses is really, really important. 
So it's not just the business intelligence function within your studio. I think the ability to expand, uh, experiment rapidly and frequently is really, really important. And that for us is, is something that we're also coming to terms with and learning. And when you talk about ability to experiment, uh, I'd like to expand it from products to also looking at services. How do we interact with the community? How do we interact with the gamers? Also looking at the business models. We see what's prevalent today, but are we really looking uh, 12 months ahead, 24 months? What, what's the market going to look like in that time frame? What, what kind of analogies can we see? What, what positions are untenable? Um, and also looking at process internally, how do you green light things? I mean, how do you take things forward? Maybe the structured way of you know, how you deal with a large console project is not the right way to deal with small iPhone projects and so forth. So a, a lot of that thinking has to happen. And also experimenting with strategy, uh, at least for us, we, I don't know how you guys run your studios, but we used to have like a, uh, an annual strategy day, the kind of workshop, we'd look at our strategy and go forward. Right now, we're breaking that down into two events a year. I think a six month cycle is much better for this market than a 12 month cycle. So we hold a large one in the spring and then we review that in the fall because lo and behold, six months in this industry, a lot of things will change and emerge. So I think that's, it doesn't mean your strategy goes all over the place, but it means that you actually do review it, you do look at it with the right people and you're ready to make those changes. Okay, obviously, because the environment is much more complex, we're also dealing with a lot of different partners. So we have larger interconnected systems, whether it's in the production or whether it's in the business side. So Chart Boost uh, and kind of analytics firms and all, all those guys, all, all doing great work that you really, really want to be working with. But on the other hand, uh, kind of in the products as well, the value chain is so large that you have a lot of vendors, outsourcing partners and so forth. But you need to be able to manage that interconnected system. And you can actually hear if you listen to your stakeholders in your in kind of your, your value network, you'll actually get really, really important information about things that are changing. It's just keeping your ears open and, and being able to ask questions. Um, so obviously, it goes without saying that any creative effort is a reflection of the team that creates it. And it turns out that happy people make better games. Uh, and I'm, I'm lucky to work with, with a lot of people who are doing this because they really love doing it. It's, it's a matter of passion. It's a labor of love. They want to do this. Um, but it's also being able to motivate your partners, making sure that your interests are aligned. If they're not aligned and there is no you know, cliche win-win, then I think it's better to get out of those partnerships because ultimately you'll just end up uh, colliding one way or the other. So I think when, when, when we look at, look at change, you're trying to place yourself in a position to win no matter what happens. And that's really obviously a very difficult task. It's a tall order, tall order to place, but that's ultimately what you want to do when you're driving your company, when you're driving your business. And for us, I mean, kind of simplifying this in many ways, when we, this is looking ahead, I mean, Remedy, we're known for our AAA console stuff, uh, kind of pushing the story, pushing the cinematic action forward, pushing the high fidelity. And we're also learning, or have been systematically learning about self-publishing, with uh, uh, five uh, SKUs shipped last year, and then also looking at kind of made for meeting the tablet interface and all the, all the good stuff that Rich was talking about. How do we build for that, that environment? How do we run games as a service in a free to play model as well? I think, you know, I'm gonna use the C word, I see convergence happening. Uh, sometimes I think it, it gets misused, uh, but I think these things are melding together and certain elements from these different different sides will come together. And I think it will be a really, really exciting time for the games industry as we see that, see that happening. Uh, coming from both directions. And you know, I know this is a used quote and, and has been, I think Steve Jobs used it, so everybody else uh, knows it as well. But I think for me as a, as a hockey fan, the greatest hockey player of all time was Wayne Gretzky. And Wayne Gretzky, he wasn't the biggest guy in the rink and he certainly, he wasn't even the fastest guy in the rink but he was the most valuable player for year on year. He has like most playoff goals, most playoff assists. I mean, a ton, this guy is awesome. So Wayne Gretzky, when they asked what makes him so great, uh, said that he's not going where the hockey puck is now, he's going where the hockey puck's going to be. And I think ultimately when you look at your company, you don't wanna go where the market's right now, you wanna go where the market's going to be and where the gamers are going to be and the, the kinds of experiences that they want in the future. So I think that wraps it up for me. Uh, it's a pleasure filling in for Jay. Sorry that he couldn't make it. Thank you for your time. And I'll be catching you guys later at the bar. Thank you.